Hey there, Touch Designer developers, Jack Delora here with the Interactive and Immersive HQ. In this video, we're going to look at recreating the style of Ben Leposky uh, within Touch Designer. So Ben Leposky was an early electronic slash computer artist who worked from the 1950s onward. Um, and he was one of the first people to take early analog, electronic, and uh, computer hardware and actually put that into a creative context to generate art with. Um, so what he would do is take an oscilloscope and some sine wave generating hardware or other electronic hardware and generate these kind of abstract um, and somewhat organic looking long exposure photographs with that equipment. Um, so within Touch Designer, we're gonna kind of take that that process or that technique as inspiration and work with feedback to generate our own kind of quote unquote long exposure photographs with this similar sort of organic oscilloscope style feel. So yes, once again, this is an opportunity to kind of explore what we can do with feedback and it should be another fun one to put together. So with that, let's jump into building this. So I'd highly recommend uh, just searching for Ben Leposky on your favorite search engine of choice to take a look at what his art actually looked like. Um, as you can see here, it's this very kind of like both geometric but organic um, art that started off in a black and white long exposure format and eventually he started working in color as well. Um, but yeah, just dive into that to get an idea for what his work looks like. Before we get started on building our effect today, I wanted to show you a very uh, kind of simplified version of what we're going to be building, just so you have an understanding of where we're headed. So um, let me just turn off the display here. Essentially what we're going to be doing is generating a very simple um, piece of geometry, which is just a circle, and then um, using a line material to only draw the points of that circle on screen instead of like the whole outline um, or a filled in version. And then we're going to be using animation um, or an animation comp in conjunction with a timer to animate and rotate and scale the uh, position of this circle in space. And what that is going to do uh, with the addition of our feedback loop, which will generate those trails, is to create this really interesting geometric um, sort of composition. And so um, just to give you a, another preview of how that will function in action, if I hit the one key, we can start the drawing process over and we can see that over time, this circle and the points that um, kind of define or make up that circle as it rotates will draw these really nice geometric um, figures on screen. So that is just to kind of again give you an idea of where we are going with the um, technique that we're about to work on. So with that let's go ahead and delete this network and jump into building this. Okay so starting with a blank network we are going to begin by adding a circle saw. This is going to be the geometry that we're drawing on screen. So within the circle stop, let's reduce the radius to a value of 0.5 in the X and Y. I'm going to then hook this up to a transform stop, which we are not gonna do anything with at the moment, but later on we'll animate with our um, animation chop channels. Then I'll add a null in case we want to ever, you know, add any additional operators here. And then I'll attach that to a geometry comp. Um, the way that we're going to approach this is uh, we're going to set up our kind of render pipeline and our feedback effect first, and then we'll come back and work on adding different things like instancing and animation second. So to prep for that rendering, I'm going to also add a material, which is going to be the line material. And I'm going to start by clicking and dragging that onto our geo and hitting parameter material so that um, that material is now applied to that geometry. Then we'll head back to the line material and make a couple of changes. Um, we're going to come to the line page first of all and turn draw lines off. Then we'll come to the point page and turn draw points on. Now uh, we're going to, in this case, we're going to leave our point size multiplier at one, but we're going to modify the point near and far color. In this case, we're going to keep those colors the same but um, you're more than welcome to experiment with 
uh, setting those to different values, depending on the position of the camera, essentially that will um, have our points that we're drawing on screen shift in color um, depending on their distance. So that's yeah, a kind of an interesting thing to play with. But for this example, I'm just gonna leave them both at the same color. So the color that we're going to use here is blue and we're going to type in zero for the red channel, 0 0.5 for the green channel and one for the blue channel. We're gonna do the same thing in the point far color parameter as well. Finally, we just have one more setting to change, which is on the common page. We're gonna turn on blending transparency so that we can um, utilize the alpha parameters later on. Then I'm gonna add a camera comp and put that above. And within the camera comp, the only thing I'm gonna change is to set our translate Z parameter to six. Now we can actually add our top uh, operators and start to render this. So I'm gonna type in um, render and grab the render top. And then before we move on from the render top, I'm going to come to the common page and set our resolution, first of all, to 1024 by 1024. Then I'm gonna set the pixel format to 32-bit float. Uh, that one isn't necessarily uh, something you have to do, but if you want to experiment with additional feedback effects later on, I'd recommend uh, changing it at least to 16-bit. Um, and then we can attach a null and actually add our feedback effect. So we're going to add basically the most simple version of feedback that we can um, apply, which is just going to be a feedback and a composite. So let's go ahead and add the feedback top first of all, and then I'm going to connect this null to operator to the input there. And I'll attach a null after the feedback in case you wanna come back and add any additional operators into that feedback loop later on. Um, and then I'll connect the output of that to a composite. We're gonna set the operation here to add um, that will get us closest to the look of the long exposures on film that Leposky was using to create his artwork with. Um, from there, I'm going to connect null 2 to comp 1 as well. And then we need to set a target top within our feedback top. So I'm just going to go ahead and drag the comp 1 operator onto that target top parameter. And um, with that, we can just apply a couple of additional post effects, and then we can work on generating our animation. So the first post effect that we're going to add is a level top. We're gonna to use the level top to add some additional brightness to our final output after our feedback effect. Well, you'll notice that uh, depending on the color that you choose for this effect, um, the output can tend to be somewhat dark, and that is kind of intentional because we don't want to blow out the highlights within our feedback loop. But um, there's a lot of cases where you want to then add some additional brightness so you can really see the detail of the drawings that you're creating. So we're gonna use the level top to adjust that brightness post our feedback effect. Then we're gonna attach a constant top and we're gonna use that to composite in a black background. So first of all, set the color here to black and then head to the output page, turn on comp with input and set the operation here to under. And then we can attach a null and that is actually it for our top uh, portion of our network. Now, one thing that I want to do just for uh, the ease of uh, generating and regenerating these drawings um, is to add a keyboard in chop to be able to reset our feedback anytime that we want to. This will be helpful later on when we actually have some animation being applied. So I'm just gonna add that keyboard in chop and I'm gonna make a chop reference from the K1 chop channel to the reset switch within the feedback top. Now we can then hit the one key and have our feedback uh, reset anytime that we want to. So, we have finished the portion of our network that uh, is dealing with the final render, and now we can actually go back and start to work more with our geometry, uh, with instancing, and then finally adding animation, which is going to be the kind of core component that actually creates these interesting drawings. 
So let's start with instancing. So uh, first of all, within the geo, we're going to head to the instance page. We're going to turn instancing on. Then we're going to add a second circle SOP to generate instances. So let's head to the SOP page and grab a circle SOP. Um, in this case, we're just going to reduce the number of divisions here to seven. That will give us a septagon instead of a nice smooth circle. Um, but again, remember that we're not going to be seeing this kind of rough geometric shape in our output. We're just going to be generating a copy of this circle at every point within this new circle that we're generating. Uh, once again, I'm going to add a transform and put that to the right. And then I'm going to add a null to the end and I'm going to title that null null space POS for position. We'll then come back to the geocomp. I'll drag null position into the translate operator. And then I'm going to grab the P0, P1, and P2 channels for the translate X, Y, and Z parameters, respectively. We can then see in our output here that we have, um, you know, seven different copies of that circle now in that same sort of arrangement that we're seeing here in our instance uh, circle. So the next thing that we're going to do is actually use a noise top to add some random rotation to each one of these instances. So they're not all sort of facing the camera in this flat orientation. So we're going to begin by heading to the top page, grabbing a noise top, and we'll make a couple of changes here. Um, let me just double check my notes here. On the first page here, uh, we'll start by turning monochrome off. Um, then we'll head to the common page and make some adjustments to the output resolution. So I want the width of this operator to correspond to the number of points within our circle that's generating our instances. So I'm going to type in for the resolution width parameter, op, open and close parentheses, single quotes, and then I want to reference circle two. And I want from circle two the number of points. That should be a value of seven. Then for the resolution height parameter, I'm going to set that to one. And we can also set the input and viewer smoothness nearest pixels so that we can see those as individual um, pixels instead of that sort of interpolated smooth look. Finally, let's set our pixel format here to 16-bit float. Then I'm going to attach a math top, and we're going to use that to increase the range of output from this operator. So we're not actually using this as like a color texture. We're using this as control information. So we're going to take it from that 0 to 1 range and increase it to actually provide some you know, visible rotation for our different instances. So what I'm going to do in this math top is come to the range page and set the two range to fall between negative 360 and positive 360. We should see something like this now. Um, now that we have done that, we can then attach a null and I'm going to title this one null space ROT again for rotation. And we're going to then head back to our geocomp drag null ROT into the rotate op parameter, and then grab the RGB channels for rotate X, Y, and Z respectively. What we should now see is that our instances are all rotated differently from one another. So we have accomplished just about everything, but we still have to do the most important part of our effect today, which is to add animation to it. Without that, we don't really get any of those interesting trailing effects that we saw at the beginning. So let's go ahead and start off by adding a timer chop, which is going to, again, drive the animation that we're applying. And I'm going to set the length here to 40 seconds. I'm then going to initialize that to ensure that the next time we start this, um, it will run for 40 seconds instead of 10 seconds. I want to also trigger this timer at the same time that I'm resetting the feedback so that we can sort of 
start with a fresh clean slate and then run through the animation once we've cleared our feedback. So I'm going to make a chop reference from the keyboard in chop to the start button on the timer chop. Before we move on from the timer chop, I'm also going to head to the outputs page and turn ready and done off and leave timer fraction on. Then I'm going to add the animation comp. Um, now we're used to probably working with stuff being generated in real time. And so you'd probably want to use something like an LFO or some other chop to generate the kind of effects that we're working with today. I found that the animation comp is helpful when we're, you know, we're not, we're effectively creating something that isn't intended to be run in real time. We're more focused on the final outcome of the movement rather than it continuously running. So it's helpful to be able to specifically define certain animations uh, for different components of our uh, drawing system with the animation comp. So I think what I'll do first is set up the chop network that this is going to um, output through and then we'll come back to the animation comp and spend some time working on those channels. So what I'm going to do first of all is set the play mode of the animation comp to output full range and then we're going to use a lookup chop to use the information from the timer to basically pull our current frame of animation from our animation comp. So I'm going to connect the timer to the first input and then the animation comp to the second input. From there, I will attach a null and I'm going to call this one null space animation because we're going to have a number of different uh, chop channels again that are all going to be used for animating. Okay, so if you haven't worked with the animation comp before, this is a great opportunity to start to experiment with it. Um, you know, it has its faults, but it can be a very useful tool sometimes. Uh, so what you're going to do is go ahead and right click on the animation comp and hit edit animation. Um, once you do that, you should see this new viewer pop up in the bottom half of the screen. And we're going to go ahead and add some channels in. Um, so the way that we do that is we type in a channel name and we hit add channel. The first channel that I'm going to add is going to be called alpha. I'll hit add and we should see that channel appear here as well as in the output of the animation comp. Then I'm going to add a channel called scale, which we're going to use to modify the scale of our geometry. Hit add. And then I'm going to add three different chop channels at the same time for rotation. The way that we do that is we type in ROT for rotation and then within brackets, I'm going to type in XYZ. That will add three chop channels with the names ROTX, ROTY, and ROTZ. Now that we've got all of those channels added, we can start to add content to those channels. Okay, so let's start by adding some keyframes to our alpha channel. So the way that you add a keyframe if you haven't dealt with the um, animation comp before is we alt and click in the graph. So I'm going to add my first keyframe at around 151 on the x-axis. And then I'm going to click on that point to adjust the value up here in the V parameter. I'm going to set that to a value of 0 0.025 and hit enter. Now that has made very little difference in our graph right now, but if I hit the H key to home the graph, we can then see um, you know, what that slope actually looks like. Now we need to use alpha values that are very low um, in order to not blow out the highlights in our feedback loop. Because again, this is going to be accumulating over a period of 40 seconds. We want to make sure that we um, really keep that dynamic range um, in that kind of below blown out range so that it is a little bit more interesting to look at. And that's why our alpha values are going to be so low. Um, the next point that I'm going to add is going to be somewhere in between maybe like 151 and 251. I think I'm going to place mine around 200 or so. I'm going to click on that point and then um, I'm going to set this one to a value of 0, 0 0.0075, which should give us a nice dramatic decrease during that section. 
From there, I'm going to add a point around maybe like 335 or so. Um, and I'm going to set that to the same value as our previous point here of 0 0.025 and hit enter. We're going to have these two peaks in our alpha. And then finally, I'm going to add a final point at around 500 or 501. I'm going to set that value, or actually, let's first click on the point. And then I'm going to set that value to 0 0.03 and hit enter. And then I'm going to hit H to home the graph. So another thing I want to do before we move on is make sure that we have an, an additional kind of trough in our uh, animation channel here between the second and third peak. So you could adjust the slope of the second uh, peak, but I think what I'm going to do instead is just add a point in between those two peaks and then drag it downwards so that we get a nice trough in between. With that, we're done with our alpha channel and we can head to the scale channel. So the scale channel, we're going to keep pretty simple. I'm just going to click on this first point on the left. I'm going to set the value here to 0 0.5. Then I'm going to add an additional point around 351 or so. Click on that point. I'm going to set the value here to 1.5. Hit enter and then hit H to home. And that is all we're going to do for the scale graph. I'm going to head to the rotation X channel next. And again, this is going to be a super simple one. Um, I'm going to set the initial point here, the value to a value of 90. Remember that we're dealing with rotation values here, so we need to think in terms of degrees instead of that uh, smaller zero to one range that we've been working in. So I'm just gonna home that graph and move on to rotation Y. Rotation Y is also going to be a very simple uh, graph. I'm gonna click on the first point, and in this case, I'm gonna set the value to 540 and hit H. We have one final channel to adjust, and that is rotation Z. In this case, I'm going to click the first point and set that to a value of negative 180. Then I'm going to home the graph, and I'm going to add a second point just before 300. Um, I'm going to click on that point and set the value here to zero. And then I'm going to leave the final point alone. With that, we have completed all of the channels for our animation. Uh, so now I'm going to go ahead and close this animation editor and we can head back to our network and start adding chop references from the animation channels that we've set up. Okay, so uh, to begin, we're only gonna use the alpha uh, channel within the line material. So we'll start there. I'm going to click on viewer active and then head into the line material, head to the point page. And here is where we're going to um, apply that alpha chop reference. Now we're going to do it for both the near and the far alpha. Again, like I was saying, you can play around with the color values for those independently if you want. We're just gonna leave them the same at this point. Um, I'm going to click and drag from the alpha channel and make a chop reference on point near alpha. And then I'm gonna do the same thing for point far alpha. Then we have scale and rotation channels. Now we're actually going to apply these in a number of different locations. Um, we'll start off with our geo. So we're gonna use the rotation channels to actually rotate our entire sort of scene, so to speak, um, all of our geometry at once. So I'm gonna click and drag from the rotation X, Y, and Z channels and drag those into the rotate X, Y, and Z parameters on our transform page. We're actually going to do the same thing to our transform attached to our circle stop. So I'm going to, again, make the same chop reference from the rotation X, Y, and Z to the rotate X, Y, and Z parameters within that transform. Finally, uh, we're going to use the scale parameter for our transform uh, that is uh, associated with our instance generation. So I'm gonna click and drag from the scale parameter and attach that to the uniform scale parameter within the transform SOP. 
with that, we are just about complete. Um, but the final thing that I'm going to do is also I want our rotation values to change based on this information that we're generating in our animation comp. So I'm going to head to the transform page here, bring up the uh, drop down for the translate parameter. And in the TZ parameter, I'm going to write an expression. So um, I think actually the easiest way to do this is I'm going to use the scale channel for this particular animation. So I'm going to make a chop reference to this TZ parameter first. And then I want to add our uh, traditional ABS time dot seconds expression in here as well so that we are both are going to be controlling it via our animation comp and adding a little bit of randomness to it from ABS time dot seconds. So I'm going to then multiply what's already there, which is op null anim and then the channel called scale. I'm going to multiply that by ABS time dot seconds. And then I'm going to multiply it by a very, very small decimal. And that is 0 0.0000. So that is four zeros and then one. And that'll just ensure that that uh, transition uh, on the TZ channel here doesn't happen too quickly and cause crazy amounts of rotation within our um, or for each one of our instances. So once you've done all of those things, what we should be able to do now is click on the display flag for our null, our final null output. I'm going to then reduce the size of that parameter window. And if we hit one on the keyboard, we should start to see this drawing. Now it's going to take a while. As we uh, talked about earlier, this is going to take a total of 40 seconds to complete. But um, you should see immediately that a geometric drawing will start to appear. So we'll just kind of wait for this to finish and then we can look at a couple of other things that you can do to play around with this network. Um, one thing that I can mention right away is that our overall brightness is still pretty dark. And as I was mentioning, the post effects that we added after the feedback loop are helpful for bringing that brightness level up. In our case, I think I'm just going to uh, bump the brightness up here to a value of two. Maybe that's even a little bit much, but um, that definitely can help us see those lines a lot more uh, clearly. And then you can also play around with the gamma. I'm going to set that to 1.5 and that has really increased the, uh, the overall clarity or, or at least visibility, I guess, of the image. So with that, we have completed everything uh, for our effect today. And um, now we can talk about different ways that you can start to push this a little bit further. So um, the animation channels are a huge opportunity for experimentation. Um, you don't have to work with the kind of channels that I've set up. You can add additional channels for maybe transform or you can completely change the um, content of those channels and make an animation all your own. You can also think about changing things like the type of geometry that we're instancing. Um, we don't have to use circles. You could use rectangles. You could use cubes. You can use anything you want. Um, and it will obviously give you a different result in the output. You can also use a different sort of instancing um, shape in itself. Like we don't have to use this septagon that we have set up, we can use something else like a box, um, which again will give us a different result. Um, basically anything that you adjust prior to the feedback will give you a slightly different um, outcome. One final thing that I would recommend considering is working with multiple colors at the same time. Um, for example, you could take this network that we have created already and simplify it maybe by uh, deleting or removing the instancing component and then copy and paste just the geometry itself um, and maybe the animation comp. And for that second set of geometry, change the color of the material and then also modify the animation. Um, you could also think about changing the geometry on that second copy so that again, we get these two kind of juxtaposed things in our render output. Uh, Leposky himself in the latter half of the 50s started playing around with these two color compositions and I think they look really interesting and could be, uh, you know, definitely a cool way to continue to push this. 
With that, we are going to close out the video. So I hope that you have enjoyed putting this together and I look forward to seeing you in the next video here on the Interactive and Immersive HQ. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you're serious about taking your touch designer and interactive skills to the next level, I highly recommend you check out the Interactive and Immersive HQ Pro. It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can learn more by checking out the link in the description. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and the little bell icon for more awesome free content.